everyone and welcome back. Today I want to do a little bit more specific video than I've been doing. I've been doing like kind of general, well, <laughs> some of the ones I've been doing are a little more philosophical, right? Um, like I, I, I wonder about life and to me those are stories which are interesting. I guess they're not very interesting to other people, but I've also done varying books like favorite childhood books and whatnot. Those are a little more general. Today I wanted to talk about a specific book series. This is the Before the Coffee Gets Cold series by Toshikazu Kawaguchi. So far there are four books in this series. We start with Before the Coffee Gets Cold. On the cover we have a picture of the little cafe, which is the setting of pretty much everything in the story. Uh, we have I, There's not a cat in the story, but I mean, why not for the cover? There are no windows in this cafe, in this specific cafe, you will note that. So there are no, no windows in here. The second book continues the stories from that particular cafe. So again, no windows, there are three clocks. They're very specific that there are three clocks in this cafe. Only one of them shows the correct time. I guess uh, it's up to us to figure out which one is which. You'll notice the cat hasn't moved. I find that really interesting. <laughs> the third book, Before Your Memory Fades, also has a cat which has moved. Um, but this one actually takes place in a different cafe. It's almost identical to the first cafe. It has the same rules and everything, which I'll get to. Um, but it does have windows. And what I noticed is that these three windows show different seasons. I thought that was really neat, even though the stories in this book take place in one season. And last is the fourth book, which I just picked up. This is brand new, Before We Say Goodbye. You'll notice the cat has moved a bit more. Maybe it's getting sick and tired of sitting in one spot. This takes place back at the original cafe. So the original story, at least, is based on a stage play. The author, uh, Kawaguchi, is a playwright and originally wrote this as a stage play and had a lot of success with it. So novelized it and has had a lot of success with that, obviously, because it has been translated and at least put out in the United Kingdom and America, where it's gotten very popular. There are a lot a lot of books put out in Japan and only a sliver of them get translated and put out in other countries, which makes sense because that is a lot of work to do if you're considering how many books there are, which really is a darn shame because I'm really into Japanese books and TV shows and there are a lot I read about like, oh, that sounds really interesting, but it's not out in this country and I don't actually read Japanese. So, a little awkward. Anyway, getting to this series, you can kind of tell, especially from the first one, that it's based on a stage play due to the bottle nature of it. Now, if you don't know what a bottle story is, particularly a bottle script, that is a story that most of the action takes place in one spot. Um, like something where, in this case, it all takes place in the cafe, it might take place in a bar, um, just one spot, and there's usually a reason why we don't leave. I, I remember writing a bottle story set in a bar, and there was a huge snowstorm going on outside, so people couldn't leave. You know, th there's often a reason like that, although not always. This one just happens to take place in the cafe. We do, um, when customers come in with their stories, you know, we'll journey back to their past, figuratively speaking, um, and I specify that. I'll explain that in a reason that reason in a minute, um, figuratively, but that is the only way, typically, that we're leaving the cafe. Now, the whole point of this cafe, and what makes it so interesting, despite the fact that it's kind of a boring little place, there are no windows to the outside, it's tiny, um, the food is, you know, it's good, but it's not like gourmet, there's nothing really distinguishing about this cafe. There is one chair that if you sit in it and you drink coffee from that is poured to you by a specific person 
in a specific cup, I think, um, in a specific way. You can travel back in time. You can do this once. I, I think you can only do it once. I don't think you can do it more times. They don't specify, but people don't, in the books at least, they don't travel back more than once. There are other rules, and that's what makes it a good time travel story because there aren't so many paradoxes. Among the rules are that you cannot change the past, even if you try. Even if you go back, meet someone from the past, tell them everything about the present, which is their future, um, the past will not change. The circumstances of the past might change, like they might do something different, but the outcome will remain the same. So that's what makes it a little different. And I, again, you can avoid paradoxes, which is kind of nice <laughs> because once you go down that rabbit hole, it could take, oh my gosh, you could be wondering about that for forever. This helps you concentrate more on the human emotional effects of traveling back in time and seeing people from your past which is the reason people come to this cafe in the first place. Another thing, and that's why it's called Before the Coffee Gets Cold, is that you have to come back before the coffee has gotten cold. And they do touch on the fact that it's difficult to tell when the coffee has gotten cold. Does that mean when it's lukewarm, like when it's just starting to get cold, or when it's bone cold, shivering, you know? What does that mean exactly? And it's never very specific. That's why uh, the lady who pours the coffee typically puts a timer in it. And as soon as it gets to whatever point the spirits or what have you have determined, that's when the timer goes off and you have to drink it down instantly. If you do not finish the coffee, you will not be able to return to the present. Also, you have to sit in the one specific seat. You cannot get up from that seat. If you do, you will instantly return to the present. That seat in the present is occupied by a ghost. That ghost gets up from the seat once every day in order to go to the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> it's a really weird excuse and this is one of those things which I think is fun as a writer because it makes no sense and many a customer comments on it like why would a ghost need to go to the bathroom and it's never answered because there really is no answer and I think that's simply because the author couldn't come up with one so they just leave it unanswered it's just one of those weird things that, that happens in any case you have to go while the ghost is gone. Then when you come back, the ghost comes back and you have to get up right away and let them have that chair back. If you try to move the ghost before that or you do not get up, the ghost will curse you. And people experience that curse in different ways when they do try it. And they will touch the ghost or try to move them and they'll suddenly feel this crushing weight coming down upon them. They'll sink to the floor and all this and until the ghost is distracted and then the curse is lifted. The proprietors of the cafe are named Nagare and Kazu. Nagare is the cook. He's a um, tall man. <laughs> it's, it's very They're very specific about that. It's always commented on because he's six foot tall, um, which is reasonably unusual in Japan. It's definitely not unheard of, but it's a little more unusual. And um, he runs the cafe with his wife Kay and his cousin Kazu. Kazu is the one who pours the coffee. Kazu is specifically interesting because she is mentioned as not being very interesting. She has she is nice looking but she has fairly forgettable characteristics. She's very understated. She's very calm and she is honest. When people ask about the rules, she will tell them point blank that's just how it is no particular sympathy or anything like that, but that can actually help them just to hear that's how it is, and you have to deal with it. Now, all these stories have re recurring things. There's the ongoing story of Nagare and Kazu and the people around them, including Kay. Kay is not in all the stories, but yes, the people around them, there's continuing things of what happens to them in their lives. Then there are the recurring regulars in the story, 
One of these is Fumiko Kiyokawa. She shows up in almost all of the books, but the first book tells her story. It begins with her story of going back in time to see her boyfriend. More recurring characters are the Fusagis. It's very neat to see them show up throughout the books. Fusagi, um, he, I don't actually know his first name, and we don't learn his wife's full, full name until the last book. <laughs> kind of interesting. Um, Fusagi is suffering from Alzheimer's, and he doesn't remember, he mostly doesn't remember his wife, and um, pretty early on in the book, he, he has gotten to the point where he does not remember who she is. She is introduced as Kotake. That is her maiden name, and early on he started referring to her as Kotake because he didn't remember she was married to him. So that's how she started referring to herself. So it's kind of like, first it's just, oh, they know each other, then it's, oh, they're married, and it kind of develops. Sometimes they do that in these stories, which is really neat. As you read along, you go, oh, that's what's going on on you hadn't realized it and it just there's some very touching stuff like that in all these stories another thing that tends to happen is that we start with these other characters in the cafe they are coming in and we're not sure if they're regulars or not that is if they're going to be in other stories or not but usually they come in early in the story and they're just there interacting with other people's stories and then they have their own story a little bit later in the book. There are always four stories in every book and it'll be like the husband and wife, the mother and daughter, just very basic story headings. But it'll be about so much more than that, of course. For example, in this one we have Yaeko Harai. She goes back in time to visit her sister Kumi. Kumi came to the cafe. We meet them early on, but then later Yaeko has her own uh, story because she learns that Kumi died in a car accident. They had had a falling out years ago because uh, Yaeko had left her hometown and pretty much left Kumi to run things, the, the family business, in her absence. Um, so then Yaeko goes back to like, apologize to Kumi and make amends. That happens, that is a recurring theme throughout these. People want to go back and first they want to change things, they want to try and change their lives, and they find out they can't. But they still go back because they want some form of closure. That is the main thing, that is the main point of these stories, to find closure. A lot of them deal with somebody mourning the fact that someone in their life has died before they got the chance to tell them something or to do something, to pass something along their regret. So they go back and they talk to the person and typically they don't even get the chance to say what they wanted to say to them, but it all works out. In one way or another, they manage to the person they're talking to just understands because they love each other and they have that understanding so they're able to patch it up make amends do what they wanted to do and it all works out they're able to find that closure and move on with their lives and somehow or another and find peace and happiness the second book goes into the owners of the cafe a bit more. Um, we have Nagare and particularly Kazu. It is revealed, spoiler alert, it is revealed that the ghost who always sits in the chair, um, a slightly older woman who's always reading a book, it is revealed that she is Kazu's mother. She went back in time to visit Kazu's father who had passed away. This was when Kazu was only seven, and Kazu was actually the one who poured the coffee for her mother. And once her mother was back in time, she lingered a little too long, the coffee got cold, 
and she became a ghost, and she's been there ever since. Kazu has been <laughs> understandably wracked with guilt since that time. It's settled on her so heavily. She was raised by an aunt, um, but it just wasn't able to take, she wasn't able to take the place of her mother. And she's dealt with this ever since. She actually tried to commit suicide at one point, um, but an older lady who was a friend of the family stopped her. And since then, she was able to realize a bit more that there are people who love her. However, she's been at the cafe pouring the coffee, and that's been her whole life. She feels that that's pretty much all she's got. At the end, she... <sighs> There's a lot that happens. But at the end, she is able to come to the point of saying, Okay, I'm going to continue with my life and be happy. And when she tells her mother that, the ghost disappears. That's all her mother was waiting for this entire time through two books. We didn't know that. Kaza didn't know that. And like I say, that's one of the things that is revealed and you go, Oh, that's what was going on. That's why these are beautiful books. Really quite beautiful. Very touching. The third book, as I said, takes place in another cafe. The first cafe is in Tokyo, and its name is Funiculi Funicula. Very cute. Um, the second cafe is in Hakodate, and it's called Dona Dona. This one is run by Nagare's sister, Yukari. Yukari um, is kind of flighty. She kind of does what she wants to, and she has gone to America to help somebody, to help one of her friends. She's the sort who always wants to help people. So Nagare has uh, come to Hakodate to help run the cafe. Now, Dona Dona has the same rules as Funiculi Funicula. It, you can also time travel there. There's a seat. Somebody has to pour the coffee. However, we have learned that it runs in the family, the Tokita family. It does not run with the males. So Nagare cannot pour the coffee, and since his sister is gone, there's nobody to pour the coffee. Kazu has had a baby. She became pregnant in the last book, and this is years later. Her daughter is now seven. Her daughter is able to take over the pouring of the coffee. So her daughter comes with, and because her daughter is so young, Kazu comes with as well. We learned about this in the last book, because Kei, Nagare's wife, Spoiler alert! <laughs> Passed away at the end of the first book. She had her daughter, but she always had a weak heart, and so having a child killed her. She pretty much knew it was going to happen, but she died giving her daughter life. She did um, journey to the future. You can also journey to the future in that seat. It's just not done as often because there's uncertainty. You have to travel to meet someone, but you can only do that if they have been to the cafe before. So if you travel to the future, you don't absolutely know if they're going to be at the cafe when you arrive. So Kay took a chance, and because they own the cafe, she was kind of able to get that. And her family and friends helped engineer the fact that her daughter would be there. However... Her husband and Kazu were not there because they had traveled to Hokkaido, Hakodate, and this is the story of that. We open it right there when Kei is on the phone. She has traveled to the cafe, and she calls Nagare, like, where are you? I've traveled to the future. Where are you? And he says, yes, I knew you were going to... He knew his wife was going to be there, but he's like, she didn't travel to see me. She traveled to see our daughter. And I think it probably would have been very difficult for him to see his wife. So he just backed up, backed out, did what he needed to do, and said, yes, just visit with our daughter. So that's where we pick up. And then we see what was going on with Nagare and Kazu. They are running this cafe, which is a little different. It's on a hillside, and it has windows, so you can see the whole town and the bay below. Doesn't that just sound beautiful? It's a little bigger. It's a little busier. 
So there uh, are a few more customers and there's part-time help. Reggie is a part-timer there who wants to be a comedian. And so we follow a bit about Reggie throughout the book as well. One of the stories, in fact, ends up being about Reggie. And uh, Nanako is a student who's regular at the cafe. And it soon transpires that she likes Reggie. And Reggie also likes her, but they're never upfront about their feelings with each other. They're finally getting to that point when he receives a call that his audition in Tokyo went well. So he's been accepted as a comedian, has this big chance. So off he goes to Tokyo. Then what the last story actually is Reiji's. He comes back, finds out that Nanako has been diagnosed with an illness and had to go to America for a transplant. So he goes back in time to let her know his feelings. He doesn't know how well the transplant is going to go. So he wants to make sure that she knows his feelings. And then when we come back to the present, he gets a postcard from her saying, oh, the operation was a success. It went great, which it did. But spoiler alert, then we find out afterwards that her body rejected the transplant soon after and she died. There's a lot of that in these books. There's a lot of death. There's a lot of people getting diseases. So that might be a little difficult to deal with um, if you're not good, you know, or, or not at the point where you can read stuff like that. Then I, I wouldn't recommend these books. Um, but again, they have a lot of stories like that because these people are finding closure and it might actually help to deal with some emotions if you're going through that. And then in this last book, like I say, this is set back at the first cafe. This is backing up in time to when uh, Nagare and Kay's baby is a baby. Um, throughout the rest of the book, she's grown up, um, and she's taking her place at the cafe, helping to pour the coffee in place of her mother and Kazu, until Kazu's daughter Sachi can also pour the coffee. So there are two girls in the Tokuta clan now who can pour the coffee. But this one is backing up, and I'm thinking it's because the full story, if you want to say, really was told in the first two books. and then before your memory fades, like I said, he kind of had to move it to another cafe. And then with this one, he backed up in time um, to tell some stories that hadn't been told. And it just seems like that's what had to happen if he wanted to keep it going because the second book brought so much closure, at least when it comes to the regulars, which really helps to wrap up the story because you can keep on telling stories of customers that come in until you're blue in the face. You can keep doing that, but really the crux of the story is the overarching plot, isn't it? Those are more like secondary plots, but the primary plot is that of the people who run the cafe. Now, one thing that I find very interesting about these books, and I'm not sure why this is, I'm thinking it's either or possibly both, because these are originally written in another language and then they're translated and sometimes there are just odd things that happen in translation. You know, like a word, a word choice may seem like, hmm, okay, that's an interesting word choice. Or just the way you're explaining a sentence um, because it doesn't translate perfectly and you have to reword it. So either there's an interesting word choice or just you choose to do it in a certain way. That's why translation is an absolute art and translators are worth their weight in gold. But sometimes it does come across a little odd. So I'm wondering if it's that or if as a playwright, I get this, if because the author was a playwright and they're now novelizing it, that's a different way of telling a story. Because with a play, you don't get into description a lot. You say, okay, here's the set. This is here. This is here. This is here. When somebody has a specific action or an emotion, you might specify if it's important. You might specify, oh, they're doing this, you know, angrily, or they're getting up and they're moving a certain way. 
Otherwise, you keep it pretty sparse because it doesn't matter when you're writing the play. If it doesn't matter to the specific plot, then you tend to leave it pretty open because that's where the director steps in and, and the actors, and they make their choices. That's not so with a novel. You're not going to fill in every single little detail because we'd be here all night, and you want to leave something up to the imagination of the reader. But there is a lot more description, and that can be tough for somebody who's not used to it. So I'm wondering if that explains something like this. Okay, Kazu did not comment. Instead, she spoke in a cool, stern manner. You know that even if you return to the past, reality won't change, right? What she meant was, you know you can't stop your friend from dying. So many customers had come to the cafe hoping to go back and prevent someone from dying. Each time, Kazu explained this rule. It wasn't that she was impervious to the grief that people felt from losing someone precious to them. There was just no getting around this rule, no matter who you were, regardless of your reason. Now, I point this out because... There is a lot of explaining of people's actions or what they say in this book. There's a lot of explaining why they said it this way. And they didn't mean it this way. They really meant it this way. And this is why they said it. And that seems unnecessary. Because if she says, you know that even if you return to the past, reality won't change. Well... This person was hoping to return to the past because their friend was dying. Of course they're returning to the past to hope to stop their friend from dying. You don't have to explain that. And you don't have to explain that Kazu is Im not impervious to the grief. She's just explaining the rule because she spoke in a cool, stern manner. And she does that a lot. She does that a lot. So she's just calmly explaining the rule. You do not have to go into that. But... The author does that. He does that again and again. And every time I read that, it sort of took me out of it a little. Like, okay, here we go again. You're going, you know, and and I just kind of skip to the next part of the plot. That's fine. That having said that, that is about the only issue I have with these books. It's just a little bit of the way the story is told. The rest of it, there are a couple maybe awkward parts which. Um, just in the way the sentence is phrased. But again, that could be a translation choice. So I'm not sure. Overall, overall though, the plot wins out. The plot is excellent. The way these characters come through is very human. And <laughs> yes, it just works. Uh, so in, in short, I highly recommend these stories. And I hope you do go, go read them. And for right now, I'm going to go get a cup of coffee. <laughs> so I'll see you next time. Bye.